This video is about various audio formats and what they are. I can't cover every format ever invented here, but I'll do my best to cover the ones that matter. Let's begin. Mono is simply a single channel of audio. Even if you route a mono signal to 457 different speakers, it's still mono. It has its uses, usually in things that are boring. Stereo is twice as powerful as mono with two discrete channels of audio. Wow. The difference between these channels would result in some cool future formats, which I'll mention shortly. Stereo was amazing when it was first shown publicly back in 1881. I was personally blown away by stereo in 1989 when I got my 16-bit Sega Genesis. Stereo continues to be awesome to this day. Quadraphonic sound was a short-lived format that enjoyed brief popularity in the 1970s. It has two front and two rear speakers, all discrete channels. Many quadraphonic recordings were extracted from the original stereo mix, though there were some that were mastered in four channels to begin with. Dolby Surround was originally known as Dolby Stereo when it was introduced to theatrical movies in 1975. It wasn't the first movie surround format, but it would be the biggest and easiest to implement for some time. Dolby Stereo is the first cool reworking of a stereo signal that I'll mention today. It's able to reproduce four channels, but they're not discrete. These channels are left, center, right, and a single surround channel. It extracts them from a common stereo connection with a specially encoded signal. Sounds that are common in the left and right channel, aka mono, are routed by the processor to the center channel. Discrete left and right sounds still go to the left and right speakers. Sounds that are in common but 180 degrees out of phase with each other are routed to the surround channel. Note that while there may be more than one surround speaker, this signal is played equally through them all at the same time. A subwoofer signal could also be extracted using a simple low-pass filter. Noise reduction was also applied as the signal was optically read from a 35mm print or from a magnetic sound head. Dolby Stereo was rebadged as Dolby Pro Logic for the consumer market, and it works the exact same way but without the noise reduction. In 2000, Dolby Pro Logic 2 was introduced, which works in a similar fashion to regular ass Dolby Pro Logic, but it adds stereo surrounds. It's actually quite impressive, especially when you consider that they're deriving all this from a simple stereo signal. There's more processing happening with the phasing of the surround channel, which tells the processor how to steer the sound behind you. Dolby Pro Logic 2X and 2Z are able to upscale, for a lack of a better term, to 7.1 surround and even add height channels, though it's not tremendously convincing. CDS was the first on-film digital sound system for movies, arriving in 1990. It stands for Cinema Digital Sound. It was configured in a 5.1 fashion with left, center, right, left surround, right surround, and a subwoofer channel, all discrete. If you didn't know, the 0.1 in 5.1 stands for the subwoofer channel since it takes one-tenth of the bandwidth. Discrete means that the channels aren't extracted from other channels like ProLogic is extracted from stereo. Anyway, you may have noticed the CDS logo in my room from time to time if you watch GameSag. Pretty cool, yeah, I like to show it off sometimes. CDS was developed by Kodak and ORC. I never cared for ORC, by the way, but that's another conversation for some other time. The compressed digital data replaced the optical sound on the film print, at least in the 35mm version. There was also a 70mm version. Unfortunately, the hardware was extremely unreliable and there was no backup if the digital sound failed. Only 10 movies were ever released in the CDS format and it quickly faded into obscurity. Dolby Digital, originally known as Dolby Stereo Digital and also SRD, was introduced with Batman Returns in 1992. The digital data was on the film like CDS, but instead lived between the perforations on the soundtrack side of the film, 35mm only. This allowed the system to fall back to analog sound if the digital was unreadable for any reason. It had the typical 5.1 configuration. The home version used the same AC3 codec but at a higher bitrate than the theatrical version. It first came to Laserdisc and then to DVD. The first video game console to have real-time 5.1 Dolby Digital encoding was the original Xbox in 2001. At the time, this was absolutely a revolutionary leap ahead in video game sound that no other console could match until the Xbox 360 and others came out. Dolby Digital Surround EX is an extension of Dolby Digital. Basically, the left and right surround channels have Pro Logic applied to them and this results in a non-discrete center surround channel. This was one of the things used to sell tickets to Star Wars Episode I, The Phantom Menace. It needed all the help it could get. It also found its way to the consumer market and it was implemented the same way. Dolby Digital Plus is a home format introduced on Blu-ray and HD DVD. 
it supports up to a 7.1 sound configuration. This is mapped as left, center, right, left surround, left back surround, right back surround, right surround, and subwoofer. All discrete channels. Dolby Digital Plus has a higher bit rate than regular Dolby Digital, but it's still a compressed format. Dolby True HD also supports up to a 7.1 channel configuration. It also has compression applied, however, this compression is lossless. That means the audio itself is in no way affected by being compressed into and then decompressed from this format. Dolby Atmos is an object-based sound format. In simple terms, this means that a single sound, called an object in this case, can be panned around the room easily by the processor. The processor knows where all your speakers are located and it adjusts the object's position accordingly. Atmos setups typically have overhead channels. You can have roughly 118 objects in the sound field moving around independently at any one time. The home version of Dolby Atmos includes a Dolby Digital Plus or Dolby True HD embedded track just in case your receiver can't process the Atmos track. An Atmos system can have up to 24 independent speaker locations plus a subwoofer. Now would be a good time to discuss PCM or Linear PCM. PCM stands for Pulse Code Modulation. This is raw, uncompressed sound data and it's not owned by any brand or conglomerates, it just is. It can have as few as a single mono channel or as many channels as, well, there's really no limit. The PlayStation 3 was the first video game system to offer real-time 7.1 LPCM as an option for sound, and any modern AVR or preamp can easily deal with these signals. Linear PCM, however, cannot be used for object-based sound. DTS was introduced into movie theaters in 1993 with Jurassic Park. That's a pretty cool movie, you should check it out, it has like dinosaurs and stuff. This was a CD-based digital sound system that synced the compressed audio on the CD with whatever frame was on screen at any given time. It was introduced in two flavors, regular stereo and five channels. In the beginning, when Jurassic Park was released, most theaters had the stereo version. Even in the multi-channel version, DTS does not feature a discrete subwoofer. Instead, a low-pass filter was applied to the surround channels and the subwoofer was extracted from them. So, while it wasn't a true 5.1 system, you'd be hard-pressed to tell the difference in the auditorium. DTS eventually came home under the same name and offered a higher bitrate for its 5.1 channel audio. That's right, the home version had a discrete subwoofer. DTS ES came out at the same time as Dolby Surround EX in the theaters and processed the center surround in the same way. DTS also had a four-channel format for the home that used left, right, left surround, and right surround speakers. This was the only discrete format beyond stereo that the PlayStation 2 could process in real time, and a few games used this. The PlayStation 2 could also send a 5.1 Dolby Digital stream, but only during cutscenes where the audio didn't have to be dynamically generated on the fly. For Blu-ray and HD DVD, they introduced DTS HD High Resolution Audio and DTS HD Master Audio. These were the equivalents of Dolby Digital Plus and Dolby True HD, respectively. DTS HD Master Audio was the one that had lossless compression. The DTS formats were generally preferred by the audiophiles when it came to Blu-ray, for whatever reason. It just felt like DTS HD Master Audio had a bit more punch than Dolby True HD, and I can't really explain why that was, but it did seem to be the case. On the analog front, DTS Neo 6 and DTS Neo X replicate what Dolby ProLogic 2 and ProLogic 2Z accomplished from a stereo connection. DTS X is DTS's take on Dolby Atmos in that it uses object based sounds and has height channels set up in the same fashion as Dolby Atmos. The exhibition and home branches of DTS split up about a decade ago, maybe more. The consumer based company kept the DTS name, whereas the theater peeps became known as Datasat Digital Entertainment. SDDS came out in 1993 on Last Action Hero and stands for Sony Dynamic Digital Sound. This was another on-film digital sound format and lived on both edges of the film print. SDDS featured up to 7.1 channels, with five of those channels being behind the screen. The channels were formatted as left, left center, center, right center, right, right surround, left surround, and subwoofer. The very large majority of movies that were mixed in the format used a standard 5.1 configuration and ignored the extra two channels behind the screen. SDDS used a version of the A-Track compression scheme just like Minidisc. If the SDDS began to fail, it would first back up to a lower bitrate version that was still digital but had fewer channels and sounded pretty mushy. If a catastrophic fail happened, it would default to the analog track or whatever backup sound format that the technician set up. 
there was never any home version of SDDS. You may be wondering where THX fits into all of this. THX is not a sound format, but rather a rigid set of standards. It began in the early 80s as a way to keep the theatrical experience as close as to what the director intended while mixing it in the post-production of the movie. THX gets its name from two things. First, of course, is the George Lucas movie THX 1138. The second is from Tomlinson Holman, the TH in THX, and the X can be for his experiment, which this initially was. In order to get the THX badge on your auditorium, you would not only have to pay a very hefty licensing fee, but also install equipment that was THX certified. The equipment would have to meet certain specifications in order for it to be THX certified as well, and the auditorium would have to be EQ'd with a THX R2 multiplexing spectrum analyzer by a THX certified technician. In addition, the theater would have to be free of noise intrusion by HVAC systems or even the projector. But things like that were sometimes ignored due to either a lazy technician or, well, yeah, usually that. Trust me, it happened more than you might think. This is oversimplifying it a bit, but hopefully you get the idea of what THX means theatrically. When it comes to consumer products, there's no way that THX can elicit the same amount of control, but they can certify the equipment that you buy, which tells you that it meets certain standards. What standards those are seem to be unclear, as even weak powered stuff could be THX certified. Many receivers will often have a THX mode which will take into account the X curve in movie theater auditoriums. It tries to correct for this in the home to sound less harsh, but often this isn't needed as many movies are having their home ports remixed and remastered for weaker home theater systems and smaller rooms. The THX label could sometimes be found on videotapes, laser discs, and DVDs, and this signified that the mastering and duplication process was held to a certain standard. I've also seen the THX logo in some video games, but I'm not sure what exactly that signifies. It's very unclear. All that really means to me is that somebody paid a license fee. In the mid-aughts, the THX name started to lose a lot of its luster because they would license it to virtually anything. As a result, THX doesn't mean quite as much as it used to to the public. How about IMAX? Is that a sound format? Well, no, it's a film and screen format. At least that's how it started decades ago. For the home format, there's IMAX Enhanced, which uses the DTSX object-based codec. It's basically kind of like THX in that it specifies a minimum level of standards for your equipment to meet in order to properly reproduce the intended sound. RO3D is another object-based sound format, this one developed by RO Technologies. It also uses height channels. Binaural audio is a technique that involved recording audio in such a way that when you listen to it back, it produces a 3D effect from the stereo signal. When done correctly, it can actually be quite convincing. This usually works best with headphones. In fact, it works great with VR systems, especially PlayStation VR. Q-Sound came around in the early 90s and offered a slight spin on binaural audio processing. You didn't have to wear headphones, but it helped if the left and the right speakers were equidistant from your listening position. While it did indeed add a bit more spaciousness than normal stereo, I always felt that it was kind of overrated and didn't deliver what it promised. The games on the Sega CD that were in Q-Sound were maybe a little bit better than regular stereo. The Capcom arcade games that featured Q-Sound were far more spacious than the Sega CD games. Unfortunately, it was almost impossible to position yourself equidistant from both speakers in the arcade, so the effect was slightly diminished. The Capcom games also sounded kind of shrill and scratchy to my ears. Suffice it to say, I've never been much of a fan and don't feel that Q-Sound was really anything special. There you go, a whole bunch of different audio formats for you. I hope this helped you understand things a bit, and I also hope it was entertaining. Well, okay, I know I'm asking for a lot hoping that it was entertaining, but I can dream. Anyway, catch you next time.